This is a second video supplement for CIS 251, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. In this video, you'll learn how to build logic gates using things you can find around the house. At the beginning of the first video, I promised to show you how to build a computer out of spare parts you might expect to find in your grandfather's garage. I then went on to show how to take a truth table and use AND, OR, and NOT gates to build the combinatorial circuit that implements it. In this video, I'll show you how to build these gates. Let's begin with the NOT gate. By definition, a NOT gate returns the opposite of its input. From a logical perspective, it doesn't matter what we call the input values. We can choose true and false, zero and one, high and low, Fred and Barney, or any other two names we like. To physically implement a gate, however, we need to pick two physically distinct conditions. There are many possible choices, but for this video, I'm going to use these two, the presence of an electric current and the absence of an electric current. In the top diagram, the switch is on, which completes the electric circuit, causing the light to glow. I'm going to call this state, where current is flowing and the light is on, a logical true. In the bottom diagram, the switch is off, which breaks the electric circuit and prevents the flow of current. As a result, the light stays off. I'm going to call this state, where current is not flowing and the light is off, a logical false. Now, let's see how to build a NOT gate based on these states. Here's the basic idea. We're going to use two circuits. The one on the left represents the input of the NOT gate, and the one on the right represents the output. We want to organize these two circuits such that the presence of current on the input circuit, which we defined as a logical true, prevents current from flowing through the output circuit, which we defined as a logical false. Conversely, we want the absence of current on the input circuit to cause or allow the presence of current on the output circuit. As a result, just like the logical NOT gate, we want the input and the output of this physical device to always have opposite states. The $64,000 question is, of course, how to make that happen. Here's a not-so-serious idea that almost works. We could just hook up a little robot. When you turn the switch on, current flows through the input circuit, which gives the robot energy that it can then use to turn the inner switch off. The problem is, of course, we're not writing a bad science fiction movie. We're trying to design something you could build yourself. So how can we actuate a switch using simple things that you actually expect to find around the house? The key is to think about the switch. A switch is simply a piece of wire that can move to either complete a circuit, allowing current to flow, or break a circuit, preventing the flow of current. We need a simple mechanism of moving this wire, such as a spring or a magnet both of which are basic tools commonly found around the house, especially in old broken toys. The challenge is that we need to be able to control the spring or magnet. Springs always pull and don't really give us a lot of control. But what about the magnet? How can we control a magnet? Well, build an electromagnet. You can make a simple electromagnet by wrapping a wire around a rod of iron or steel, like a nail. When current flows through the wire, the nail becomes a magnet. When the current is turned off, the nail loses its magnetism. If you graduated high school and never built an electromagnet, you need to have a chat with your district's curriculum director. Here's how we use springs and electromagnets to build a knot gate. First, connect the spring to the inner switch in such a way that it holds the switch closed. This means the switch is always on unless something acts to turn it off. Or, Another way of saying this is, at this point, our NOT gate is true by default. It's going to have a true output unless we take a specific action to make that output false. Next, we're going to connect the input to an electromagnet. When the input switch is off, it means the electromagnet is also off, or not magnetized. Therefore, it's not countering the spring, and the output circuit remains closed, and the output remains true. When we turn the switch on, the electromagnet becomes magnetized and that magnetic force then pulls against the spring and breaks the circuit, thereby producing a logical false output. When the input switch is turned off, current no longer flows through the input circuit, which means the electromagnet becomes demagnetized, and without the magnet pulling against the spring, the spring pulls the circuit closed, again generating a true output. So there you have a NOT gate. You don't seem impressed. Perhaps I need to do something a little fancier. How about if I build an AND gate using the same technique? 
The trick to building an AND gate is to wire two switches in series. The circuit is complete only when both switches are turned on, or both switches are closed. So if we equate switches in the ON position to the logical TRUE, the output of the circuit is TRUE only when both inputs are TRUE. If only one switch is on, either the left switch only or the right switch only, then the switch that's off breaks the circuit, which means the light remains off and the circuit has a logical false. Thus you can see that each possible combination of switch positions corresponds to one line of the AND gate's truth table. At this point, we need only connect these switches to springs and magnets. First, notice that unlike the NOT gate, the inner switches are set to be OFF by default. The springs pull the switches open unless there's an electromagnet on to counteract the spring. Thus, as we just saw, both inputs must be TRUE in order to complete the output circuit and generate a TRUE output. If either input is false, then one of the output switches is open, which breaks the output circuit, producing a logical false. To build an OR gate, we connect the switches in parallel. Since there are now two paths through the circuit, if either switch is on, or both switches are on, then the circuit is complete and the output is a logical TRUE. Again, you can see that each possible combination of switch positions corresponds to one line of the OR gate's truth table. As with the AND gate, we can now connect these switches to springs and magnets. When both inputs are false, the springs hold both inner switches open, producing a logical false output. Turning one input to TRUE closes one of the two paths through the output circuit. Either the top, as we see here, the bottom, or both. This spring and magnet mechanism we used is called a relay. Not that kind of relay. This kind of relay. An electric switch. In this picture, you can see the armature, the part that moves to make or break a circuit across the contacts. You can also see the coil of wire that makes the electromagnet and the spring that counters the electromagnet. Relays similar to this were used in computing devices for many years. Most notably, the machines that routed telephone calls used relays. One of my colleagues who worked in the telephone industry before becoming a professor suspects that there may still be a few relay-based pieces of telephone equipment still in use. In addition to relays, the first computers also used vacuum tubes as electric switches. For example, ENIAC, which was built during World War II, contained 17,468 vacuum tubes, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, and 10,000 capacitors. On the downside, it also weighed 30 tons, which is one of many reasons that today we build logic gates out of transistors. Derek Muller does an excellent job explaining how transistors work on his Veritasium YouTube channel, so I'll refer you there rather than making a futile attempt at producing a better video. So now you know how to take a bunch of springs, wires, and nails and make a device that can compute anything you can express as a truth table. The challenge is, of course, that you must express the truth table's inputs and outputs as sequences of switch positions. In the next two videos, I'll discuss how many switches you need in a given situation and how we commonly encode integers as a sequence of switch positions, something we call binary. I'll also take the idea of binary and generalize it to numbers of any base. As always, thanks for watching.